Good morning. Um, welcome to, welcome back after from spring break. Um, I hope you all had a good break and um, I'm sorry I couldn't be here today. So, um, I will jump right in and, and uh, start the lecture today. And if you have any questions, feel free to talk to um, Chris Bannon here. So, essentially, we are going into the um, the fourth module and we are looking at storage, you know, um, persistent storage. So we started off with the looking at the, the CPU and figure out, you know, the scheduling, different abstractions, then we looked at main memory. Now we are trying to look into uh, this. And this are persistent, meaning whatever you store there tends to stay there and they are cheaper compared to the other memory that we looked at, but they are also slower. So before we start into how to organize the disk and, and, and issues like that, I'm going to spend uh, this lecture on what are files and what are the different aspects, what are the different operations on files. Um, this should be sort of a review because most of us use files on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'll, I'll give a brief overview of what, what, what I mean by files and everything, um, which affects our, um, our system as we, as we move forward when trying to do the um, Design the file systems and stuff like that. So, okay. so the um, files are essentially a, a, a contiguous, contiguous uh, data. So you have a file and it has its own. Um, you think of it as an address space. And you can store data or programs or or what have you. So it, it's essentially a large collection of, of bytes and uh, files are organized different ways in different operating systems you know uh, for example it, it may have no no structure at all it may just be a sequence of words and bytes unix typically deals with files like that so files appear as, as a, a collection of bytes with no meaning whatsoever on the different fields you can associate little structure with the files you, know, you can associate lines and pixel and variable and what have you, and different operating systems have done different uh, different things, and or you may have complicated uh, data structures. We may have uh, formats and, um, and 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 what what have you. Um, so some of the examples of those formats are, are are programs. You know, they have data and all those things embedded into a single file. So it's not necessary. I mean, it's not clear who interprets those. So for example, the operating system may consider files to be a string of bytes and the application may treat them whichever way they want, right? So when you save a PowerPoint document, from the PowerPoint's perspective, the document has structure and, and all the, you know, like slides and all those notions, whereas the operating system considers them just as files. So, but, so there is a push, you know, back, like I mentioned before, back to the, to a model where the, um, the OS itself knows the structure. You know, WinFS, the upcoming Microsoft file system, um, would have a notion of files having more structure themselves, and we've done that in the past. And we're going back to the the same model. So there's there's arguments for different ways of doing this stuff. So. Um, so we are back in back in business. Sorry. Um, so. Like I said, files have, you know, so th there are a number of files that we, we typically operate on. So the, the table gives you a, a list of files. I'm not sure if you can read it through the video and the uh, lecture handout should be there so you can, you can follow along. So essentially there are different kinds of files like executables and objects and source codes, batch files, what have you. And OS may look at them based on the extension. So for example, exe in Windows typically is an executable file, uh, OBJ is object file and, and, and so on and so forth. And it's not said, you know, it's not said that it has to be like this way, but this is one one way most operating systems deal with these things. Um, and depending on the operating system, each file has different set of attributes, attributes of the file. So for example, name is typically the one thing that is human readable that makes sense to the human user, not necessarily for the system. The system usually goes with the identifier, uh, a unique, unique tag. Um, there are 
you know, depending on what the operating system can do, you, you, you can have a type for the for the object, a location where it's in the physical disk. We haven't looked at the disk yet, but you know, essentially a, a location, um, the current size and protection, uh, time, date, and other other attributes. So. I'm I'm gonna show you like you know the two two uh, popular ways of how how this shows up. So in, in Unix, if you do a ls minus li, which shows you know a lot of attributes about the about this object. So this lecture dot twenty two dot ppt happens to have uh, I know number of two six zero four seven eight two three, which is the internal ID that the operating system knows this file as. Uh, it has certain mode bits, you know, the rw dash and so on. Um, it essentially gives the permission. We'll see what that means later. Um, and then it has, you know, the the owner as surrender and group as staff and finance six four eight zero as the size and the time and the date it was created and so on. And if you look at this through the uh, Mac OS, right, it has more structure. The the OS itself knows uh, of a concept called uh, kind, so it knows this uh, Microsoft PowerPoint document. And it has more more information than what you see from the Unix perspective. It has it has uh, groups and others like we saw in, in the other slide, but also other other notions. And Windows has its notion of what the what the file attributes are. Right. Um, so what is more interesting to us is it, it, it's, a, it's abstract data type. So the set of operations that are possible on a file. Um, and the typical operations which are possible on a file are create, write, read, reposition, delete, and truncate. Create will create a new file. Write and read would read and write write contents. A reposition, you know, depending on the type of type of operation supported by the file, it would, it may let you go asynchronously to some other part of the file. And delete would delete the whole file. Truncate would delete from that point on to the end. So. When you do an open operation on a file, you have to figure out sort of in the disk, you, you, we haven't talked about this case, but essentially you have to figure out where it's stored, where this particular object is stored. So if you give a name and said, I want to open the file, you have to first map from whatever name you have into what the system would know and open those structures. Right? Open or, or prepare itself to be read or uh, written. And when you do a close, you kind of do the opposite. You make sure that everything uh, has to go back into the disk is, is gone and um, you you prepare to end, end the session with this file. So open files would have lots of in-memory data structures, which is sort of similar to what we did with pages and stuff. So one of the things we need to keep track is the uh, file pointer, which essentially says what would be read next or what would be written next if you do a read or write. So essentially the reposition call would move this pointer, but if you don't reposition, that basically states what is the, where, where I am in a file. So if a file is a large file, it tells you where I'm start. And the other information we need to keep track is file open count. So if you allow files to be shared by different users, this tells the operating system how many people have opened the file, and you know based on that it, it can do other stuff, and you know the dislocation of, of of where the objects are and and the access types. Like memory, you know we if you if you talk about sharing, we need to have a notion of of locking. Um, locking would would allow the um, the system to um, you know, the similar to the, to the memory thing. So, two, two, two processes are sharing. Then, locking primitives would let them coordinate their operations. And different operating systems again provide different kinds of locking. You can have mandatory locking, where if you lock the file, then depending on how you lock it, other processes won't be able to violate the locking model. So, if you lock it exclusive then nobody else would be able to access the file. Whereas adversary locking, which is more common among operating systems, tend to, so if you have another cooperating application, it can ask the operating system if the file is locked, and if it is locked, it can do something about it. But if that 
application does not ask, then it's free to do whatever, right? So it, it, it's, it's sort of in the middle, so you don't pay the full penalty of mandatory locking, but you know, it, it's there if you want it. So the, the, the two access models are sequential and direct access. And I'm, I'm gonna kind of go through these things really fast because I'm guessing that many of us have programmed using files you know, in a lot of other courses, including this one. So many of this may be uh, you know, obvious. So in the notion of a sequential access, you, you know, you read from the beginning, you kind of read or write sequentially. It does let you go back. You, know, you can rewind and start back from the beginning, but you rarely tend to move back and forth, right? And with direct access, you have to kind of go with in some point of the file, read some things and then go away. So you know to illustrate this in a you know more with using a figure, so sequential access basically you start from the beginning, so you have this current position or the position where you're doing some reading, so you're allowed to keep reading sequentially, you know moving forward, or you can rewind and start back from the beginning. You rarely tend to move back and forth, um, and they are both sort of you know you can implement one with the other and so on. So um, if you want to implement sequential access on a, on a direct access file. Um, so essentially when you do a read next, you, from wherever your current pointer is, you do the um, read one byte and then move the current pointer up. And the same with the, with the right one. And when you do a reset, you know, you, you set the current pointer all the way to the back, right? And if you do want to implement the direct access or a sequential access, will be slow. Essentially, whenever you do a seek, you go all the way back, you do a rewind, and then you start reading from there till the point where you want to read, right? And some of these are dictated by the particular media. We'll, we'll see what the different types of media are in the next class. But think of it as sequential access is what you would get from your, from a cassette tape or a VCR tape or one of those things. Those are sequential access if you can you can listen to the song, listen to the movie or something sequentially. But if you want to um, do something random access, you have to stop and then kind of rewind the, the tape and then start listening from there. Um, whereas the direct access is more like your hard disk or CD, something like that, where you can jump to wherever you want. Right? And, and and we'll we'll go through the more details of that in the uh, in the in subsequent lectures. And I, I briefly mentioned that you can have some organization in the file. So if you take in a database course, you know, you, one of the things you look at is, you know, uh, databases having some structure. So if you have a table with lots of entries and stuff, a relative file would actually keep these things in the in the way that your database sees it, right? So this is more of a database kind of concept. So in the in a relative file, um, you may have the the record fields known to the operating system, not just unknown. So the, the OS itself provides some mechanisms to define these operations. And if you do index index file, then OS itself may, knows the concept of primary key, secondary key, what have you, right? Rather than rather than running a separate database program, which will give you these abstractions. So the argument is not that database model is good or bad. It's whether the OS should know it, or whether you should go out and buy something like Oracle to give you those primitives, right? So the, the next abstraction is the notion of directory. And directory is, is, so directory and files all reside on the same storage media, disk or, or CD or what have you. The directory are special kinds of files that hold information about regular files. So they kind of are pointers. So if you want to open a file, you search the directory to find out what file you want and that tells you information about the other files. So the OS may treat the directory and the file separately, I mean differently or the same, but on the disk they're both the same. I mean they're, they're, they're basically some, some content. And directory content is meant for the operating system and file content are meant for the uh, users. So, you know, so the directory can directory may be, um, so if you have a single disk, the directory may 
may be spread out depending on how, how we lay it out in different ways. So you can logically look at the disk into multiple partitions and have different directories or you can concatenate two disks and, and create a single directory. And we will we'll go to examples of how these things happen later in the class, but essentially the, the takeaway message is directories are meant for the operating system to keep track of where the files are, uh, but other than that they are not anything special. And the set of operations you perform on directories are search for a file, create a file, delete a file, list a file. So when you create a file, you have to make appropriate entry on the directory um, directory object. When you delete a file, you have to delete the appropriate entry, and, and so on. Right? So the question then becomes: so directory is the uh, is the uh, is the entry point for your for your program. So the efficiency with which you can operate on the directory shows up in how fast or how slow your program is. So if you're if you if it takes you a long time to search through a directory to find your object, then your programs will be slow because every file access would have to make this directory entry. Okay? And the other concept you want is depending on how the objects are named, a certain directory structure may be more more useful. So for example, if you want a single uh, a file name to be unique on the same machine, right? Then you have your you are allowed certain way of organizing. But if you allow the same file name to exist in multiple different contexts, so for example, if I have a file called um, public HTML or www directory, right? So if you're going to allow me to have one and you to have another one and so on, then we need we are forced to certain kind of directory structure. Or if you say everyone in the system is allowed to have only one name, then you have to, you're allowed to have directory structure. I'll, in the next slides, I'll, I'll, I'll show what that means. So essentially, the different ways of organizing a directory from a system perspective is a single directory for the whole system, a two level or multi-level or a three level. In a single level, there is no, I mean, think of it as there are, there are directory entries and there are files. Right, there are no no hierarchy or anything, so this kind of forces each name to be unique. So you're not allowed to, you cannot have two different names. So if you have a file called cat and it points to a file, right, you can't really create another file called cat because then the names will collide. So the system only knows about one name, and this also tends to get long. So if you think of something like the Notre Dame file system, if you send them all in straight line. A, everyone can have only a unique name. So you have to figure out what to call your programs in a certain unique name. Creating groupings, logical groupings is kind of hard because everything is, is laid out like that. And searching could be hard because now you have like whole campus worth of files all in a single straight line. But it, it makes sense for simple files. You know, So it makes sense for something like sort of like your, what your iPod and stuff would store because you know, it, it's, it's really not sharing with too many users, and this this keeps things simple. So a, a little variation on that is a two-level directory structure, where you have you know a master level called users or something, and then you have multiple um, single level stuff. So you, you know in this example you see user one, user two, user three, user four, and each one of them have their um, have their own space. So now I'm only forced to have a single name for all my files. I don't have to compete with anybody else, right? But you still have the notion, I mean, it, it's still this kind of mess. I mean, I can't create a, uh, uh, a a logical grouping. I can't say all projects from this homework project should go, should have some kind of grouping. You know, it's all out there. But, you know, various operating systems did that. So uh, BMS back back in 70s would, you know, did some model like this. And sharing is not that easy because you know the the name is associated with the user, so you have to kind of get access to the user, and then get access to the the name that you're looking for. What is more prevalent and what you're probably used to most of your life is the is a tree tree structure directory, where you have a root and then you have all these things hanging around. So the names have to be unique around across each entry of a particular of a node but not everywhere, right? So you are allowed to have 
call your file main.c for different projects if they belong to different directories right and and, and we we been using this for for a long time so um it, it's fairly intuitive how these things work and it's 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 easy to search in this in this kind of a structure if you assume a notion of a current working directory right so when you if you're using a GUI kind of thing, you know, when you open up a window, you see a, a, a window, you only operate on, on that particular window. You only operate on files on that window and so on. And if you're working on a project on, on a shell, you cd to a directory and you do a compilation or what have you on the build stuff. So even though the Northern file system is fairly large with, with a large number of files, all you're worried about is that little tiny space that you're currently working on. So it, it gives you a grouping capability and it makes the searches faster because each directory doesn't tend to be really big. It, it tends to be fairly small, right? So most of your say, course project, you probably have a few files, a make file, a couple of source files and all those things in a little directory. Right? And the, the, the way you operate them depends on the operating system. So you could, um, so you could, you can imagine um, being accessed in the in absolute absolute or relative term. So you, you could say uh, all this access files are CD slash, you know, slash AFS slash any.edu slash the whole thing or from current directory different ways, you know, like dot dot and, and so on, right? Um, anyway. So when you when you talk about a a, a, a directory as a um, talk about directory, you can either imagine that there's the cycles in them, right? So the acyclic graph directory means that you are not you don't have a cycle. You don't have a cycle that where the files go through. So for example, in in this in this particular figure, right? You you may think of the that circle that circle has pointers from this count and that count, but there's no circle. There's no there's no uh, cycle in the, in these set of graphs. Um, and the way you have these two pointers is is through aliasing, and different systems call it differently. So essentially, one of them is a hard link and one is a soft link. And Unix has notion of a hard link and soft link, and Whichever way, whichever the you know the, the specialties of the world, essentially they both are aliasing the same content. So in the file system name, it looks like from count you access the same file, and from count you access the the same file. And if you delete one of them, right, you have to figure out what happens. So if you delete this count, right, you have to figure out what happens to here. So essentially this link is gone, so you, you have to keep track of, you know, this is still there, so you keep it. If both of them are gone, then you need to delete this content. So when you create a new file, I mean, you create these links, right? You have to figure out if the, so the, the notion of a soft link or a hard link says that if it's a hard link, you, you kind of, point to that all this always knows about the pointing all the time but when you have a soft link essentially the link only exists when you um, when you look for it so I can create a soft link to a file but not actually access it till I, I get a chance to uh, use it right? so in in general graphs may have loops and which is part like you know, Unix Unix does because it doesn't really care what you do so in over here if you look here from book you can actually access ABI and ABI accesses back the book. So if you set up the aliases in a certain way you may have loops, right? And the problem is depending on how you try to access them. So if you from here if you do you know if you if you try to do a breast first search or something and you have loops, then essentially you go into a infinite loop. Because if you're chasing these pointers, then essentially you would keep looping here. And the OS need not get, need not worry about it. Um, 
or if it worries about it then it, it can you can specify that the pointer should only be to files and not directories and so on so the OS can enforce that there should be no no cycles or the OS can just leave it up to the user so if you were to do a um, press first search on these ones then you essentially go into a loop um, so the 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 next or the the last big, big uh, event I want I want to talk about is the notion of a uh, mounting. So you depending on the how the hardware is set up and everything, a file system exists as a collection. So you kind of graph these file systems together into a larger file system, and that operation is called mounting. And a mount point it, it is how you is the graph point, right? So it, it's easier to explain with, with a graph. So if you look at this graph, right, over over here, the, the B stuff, that is a file system. That's a file system which hasn't been mounted. It has its own directory naming and directory tree, but it just kind of hangs in there. And this is how you want it after it's mounted. So essentially, you take the root of this tree and you mount it at a mount point called users. So once you mount it, then it looks like the one over here, but it's being grafted by different file systems, and each one of the file systems is self-contained, but it only has a partial tree by itself. Right. So once you mount it, then it will get the whole whole space. And so this is how Unix kind of tends to put these different directories. So to the end user, it's transparent. You know, they don't know whether users is a directory it's in one file system or the other and it's kind of mounted. Windows does that in a sort of less transparent way. So if you, you know, different disks show up as C drive, D drive, E drive, what have you. So when you do a um, you know, CD, you know, C colon, then essentially you go to that disk and whatever is in that disk shows up. More The newer versions of Windows also supports the notion of mount. It's not uh, while uh, it's not very popular, um, but essentially you can do the same thing like you do with Unix. Essentially, you can mount files in a sub, in a, in a given uh, drive on, on a different location. It does not have to stick always at the you know C colon or, or what have you. Um, but for the most part, you know the normal if you put a CD in, it shows up as E drive or something, and you have the whole tree. Whereas in Unix, it has to kind of mount at some point. So it, it always looks like you have one global slash and whatever you want this like under that. And so the, the 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 last aspect of files is you want to look at is the um, so if you have a multi-user system then you want to be able to share these files and sharing this is very similar to how we did the memory uh, and, and stuff like that. So we have to figure out how to protect you know, make sure that people only the right set of people can share, and only the right set of people can write, read, you know, different kinds of sharing. Um, and especially if you go into a distributed system, which we are not going to focus much on in this class, you also have a notion of what's the what's the sharing semantics. Because if you're sharing files, you know, the the, the problem with the with the memory was memory was close together. So when you talked about memory sharing. The pages were close enough to each other that you had a you had an issue with um, the, the the timing was a bigger deal. When you're talking about file systems, they are further apart, so things are slower. So you you may get into a point where it, you don't see the same view from different points. You may it, it, it takes you so much time that two processors may see different points, right? Um, and so the first thing is you need to make sure that only the right set of people would have access to it. So you have, so the file knows who are the users and groups sh who should have access to it. And you know, the file system matches with that and then figures out what to do, right? So what would happen if you were to take a, take a file and mount, you know, take a file from a CD and have set of users, you know, user IDs and stuff, and take it to a different machine and mount it. Right. So the file system in the CD has a notion of users and groups, 
is essentially bound to a notion of user ID and group ID. So if you take it to a different machine where the the user ID maps to different users, so for example, if in my laptop, user ID 100 is me, and in your laptop, user ID 100 is you, so if I mount it in your laptop, it look like the files are created by you, right? And that may or not be a good thing, but that's 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 what happens. So the the consistent semantics, I'm not going to go through too much detail of it. You know, we'll we'll see that a little later in terms of the um, of of distributed systems and stuff. Essentially, that says what would happen if two different processors are sharing the files. So in the Unix file system, if two two processors have the file open at the same, you know, uh, open at the same time for writing. Whatever one process writes, the other will be able to read it, right? And it seems like the obvious thing to do, which is not really true for AFS. So in your AFS home directories and stuff, the the semantics are a lot more trickier. The semantics is essentially says that if two people have, if two processes have the file open at the same time and one process closes the file so that any new process which comes along would see that effect of the closed process right but the, the other process which is running at the same time would not see these changes right so for example the the idea is if you have one process and two process operating on the same file right and if it if this does a close, right, and this process continues to work, and a new process comes here, does a open. This process would see the outcome from here, but this process will not see the output from here into this process, right? Um, it, it, if you get a chance, we'll, we'll go into more detail in the distributed, system, distributed uh, systems part of the course, and if not, there are separate class, you know, the um, distributed systems class will go into more detail of how, how these things work. And I, I, I kind of briefly talked about protection bits and stuff, so essentially you have, depending on, on the operating system again, different marks of protection, you know, protect against read, write, um, execute, append, and, and so on. So you can, depending on the operating system, you can be pretty rich or pretty sparse. The, in the Unix model, you have the owner, group, and other, and each one of them have read, write, or execute privilege. So the, the owner can have read, write, or execute, and the group may have different, and the public may have a different set of um, privileges, and you assign a group to a, to a uh, to a file either by using the ch uh, group command or by default. I mean, you know, who are, all the files I create are in my group. Windows, Windows NT have a, have a, a much richer access, access control model. So if you go into the properties, you'll notice that you know I can give different users different privileges. I don't have to bunch them into groups. Right? I can have more groups. I can have more users for a given, given set of files. So it, it's a little bit more um, richer and stuff like AFS have similar access control model. And Unix, Unix, you know, if you do a ls minus l on Unix, you'll see that it has owner and a group and what privileges that they have. And you know, that's sort of like what you have in this thing here. So that's about it for, for this lecture. And hopefully, um, I mean, you know, this the, we've been working on files beyond this class for a long time so hopefully many of these things are are fairly uh, obvious and i'll see you guys on friday and we can continue from there thank you